Hello, my name is Kevin Grody. I am the Reservoir Regulation Team Lead for the Missouri River Basin Water Management Office. My team is responsible for forecasting the upper basin runoff as well as running models to determine the releases to be made from Gavin's Point Dam. This is video three of four, system overview and runoff forecast. As seen on slide three, the Missouri River Basin is very large, 530,000 square miles. And in this basin is the Missouri River, 2,321 miles long, making it the longest river in the United States. The Missouri River starts in Montana, flows through North Dakota and South Dakota, splits Iowa and Nebraska, splits Missouri and Kansas, and then eventually flows east through Missouri until it reaches the Mississippi River at St. Louis. There are six main stem projects on the Missouri River that are regulated by this office. We have Fort Peck in Montana, Garrison in North Dakota, and then Owyhee, Big Bend, Fort Randall, and Gavin's Point in South Dakota. I'm now moving to slide four. As I've stated earlier, this office regulates the main stem projects. We regulate the projects to meet the eight congressionally authorized purposes of flood control, navigation, water supply, hydropower, fish and wildlife, irrigation, recreation, and water quality control. As noted on this slide, our number one priority in making regulation decisions is life and safety. Our operational decisions are driven by the runoff that is occurring. Let's move to slide five. This slide shows the portion of the basin that drain into the federal reservoirs in the basin. The area in purple in Montana is the drainage area that flows into Fort Peck. Between Fort Peck and Garrison is shaded in blue. Between Garrison and Owyhee is shaded in purple. Between Owyhee and Fort Randall is shaded in a dark red. And finally, a light green between Fort Randall and Gavin's Point. All told, about 250,000 square miles of the basin drains into those reservoirs. There are also some areas shaded in green in Wyoming and Colorado and up in North Dakota. Those indicate the drainage areas above federal projects that are regulated by the Omaha District. There's also an area shaded in gray in western Montana and western Wyoming. That is the area that is considered the mountain snowpack and I'll talk about that later during the presentation. I also want to point out the area in Kansas and Nebraska and Missouri that's shaded in orange. Those are the projects that are operated by the Kansas City District. What's important to note about this graphic are the areas that don't have any shading. Most of Nebraska, eastern South Dakota, western Iowa, and a good portion of Missouri. Those areas have no projects, no dams or reservoirs to capture runoff. They are the unregulated portions of the Missouri River Basin. So let's move to slide six. We include this graphic to show the relative size of each of the main stem projects. As you can see, the upper three reservoirs, Fort Peck, Garrison, and Owyhee, are by far the largest of the six projects. 90% of the entire system's storage is in the upper three, and sometimes we refer to these projects as the big three. The areas of each bar represent the zones, which I'll talk about on a later slide. 
What I do want to point out is the bar areas that are colored beige and red. Those, when combined, are the flood control zones, which is what we're talking about when we speak about the 16.3 million acre feet of flood control storage. What's important to note is that the flood control storage is primarily in four projects, the Big Three and Fort Randall. When it comes to flood control, Big Bend and Gavin's Point are not significant players. Those two projects are re-regulation projects, meaning that whatever comes in goes out. Let's move to slide seven. This slide represents the system storage. It's as if we took all six projects and moved them into one. Because we do make some of our decisions based on how much water is in the entire system. Currently, storage is 58.7 million acre feet, occupying 2.6 million acre feet of the 16.3 million acre feet of designated flight control space. There are four zones. The bottom zone is the permanent pool, which represents the minimum amount of storage needed at each project to meet purposes such as hydropower. The largest zone is the carryover multiple use zone. The water in this zone is used to get us through long extended droughts. When it comes to droughts, the big three are the ones that are impacted. Water is drawn from their carryover multiple use zones to serve all purposes. The lower three, Big Bend, Fort Randall, and Gavin's Point, are not impacted by drought. Their elevations are held fairly steady through the droughts. The uppermost zone, the exclusive flood control zone, as the name implies, is reserved exclusively for flood control. When water is in this zone, all our operational decisions are for flood control. The zone we like to be in all year round is the annual flood control and multiple use zone. Ideally, we start the runoff year, which is on or about March 1, at the base of the annual flood control and multiple use zone or a storage of 56.1 million acre feet. As we see the plains snow melt and run off from the early spring rains, we would normally see the storage rise into the annual flood control multiple use zone. It rise even further during May, June, and July when the mountain snow melts and the spring and runoff from the spring rains and early summer rains occur. After the storage peaks, which is usually in early July, we then meter that water out over the late summer, fall, and winter to continue to meet authorized purposes. Ideally, we then start the next runoff season at the base of the annual flood control and multiple use zone to begin the process again. We evacuated all 2019 stored floodwaters on January 20th of 2020. I'm now on slide eight. The graph shows those four storage zones for the four projects that has significant flood control storage. Let's start with Fort Peck, which is on the top left. We are currently 1.9 feet into the 16 foot flood control zone. At Garrison, the top right, we are 2.8 feet into the 17.5 foot flood control zone. At Oahe, which is the bottom left, we are 2.4 feet into the 12.5 foot flood control zone. And finally, Fort Randall, the bottom right, we are 5.3 feet into the 15 foot flood control zone. We expect the pool levels in Fort Peck, Garrison, and Oahe to rise further into their flood control zones over the next few months. Let's move to slide nine and talk about runoff. The runoff into the upper basin comes from three sources, plain snowmelt, mountain snowmelt, and rainfall. Plain snow usually melts in March and April. During that two month period, when the plain snow is melting, 
and we're receiving early spring rainfall, about 25% of the total annual runoff is realized. During the three-month period of May, June, and July, when the mountain snow is melting, we're, we are receiving spring and early summer rainfall, and that's about 50% of the total runoff. So during the five-month period from March through July, we normally receive 75% of the total annual runoff in the upper basin. The other 25% occurs from August through February. Our runoff forecast for 2020 is 35.5 million acre feet. We update this forecast each month and more often if conditions change significantly. So what does 35.5 million acre feet mean? Well, last year we saw an upper basin runoff of 60.9 million acre feet, which was the second highest runoff in 122 years of record. If realized, our forecast of 35.5 million acre feet for 2020 would be the 12th highest runoff in 122 years of record. I'm now on slide 10. This graph shows those 122 years of upper basin runoff. You can see the bars for 2011 and 2019, the highest and second highest years. This graph shows how variable the runoff has been since 1898. We've colored some of the bars tan to indicate the four drought periods that we've experienced. Some folks have wondered how we decided how big to design and build the projects. It was that first brown area runoff from 1930 to 1941, the 12-year drought in the Depression era, that was used to determine how much water we need to have in the carryover multiple use zone to get us through a long, extended drought. So let's move to slide 11. This graph shows that 35.5 million acre foot forecast for 2020 and how it stacks up month by month. The red bars indicate the long-term average for each month. The three blue bars indicate the runoff that we've already seen in 2020. As you can see, runoff in January, February, and March have all been above average primarily due to the very wet soil conditions throughout the entire basin. As seen with the yellow bars, we're forecasting runoff to be above average every month of this year. I'm now moving to slide 12. I'll step through each of the three runoff components. The upper left graphic shows that the plain snowpack peaked in late February. For much of the upper basin, plain snowpack was sparse. However, there were areas of eastern and central North and South Dakota where plain snowpack was fairly heavy. This graph shows the snow water equivalent or the liquid content of that snow. At its peak, there were areas in the Dakotas that had four to five, and in some areas, five to six inches of snow water equivalent. Most of that snow has melted by the last week in March. The lower right graph shows plain snow as of April 9th. There was an early spring storm that did occur over the upper basin in early April, but the vast majority of that snow has already melted. I'm now on slide 13. The second component of runoff is the mountain snow. The mountain snowpack normally accumulates starting in October and peaks around April 15. Mountain snowpack affects the two upper projects, Fort Peck and Garrison. As seen on this graphic, mountain snowpack is accumulating at slightly above average rates in both reaches. So let's move to slide 14 and talk about the third component of runoff, which is rainfall. Now, Doug Klux already spoke to these in video two, but briefly, these images show the National Weather Service's three-month precipitation outlooks for the next six months. The upper left graphic indicates a slightly increased chance for above normal precipitation in the basin for April, May, and June. The lower right graphic indicates equal chances for above normal 
normal and below normal precipitation in the basin for July, August, and September. I'm now on slide 15. Slide 15 shows the precipitation that has occurred over the last 90 and 30 days. Precipitation over the first three months of 2020 has been fairly normal with small areas receiving above normal precipitation. And my last slide is slide 16, which shows the basin conditions. The upper left graphic is from the National Weather Service's Climate Prediction Center and it indicates that only a small area of eastern Colorado is experiencing any sort of drought conditions in the Missouri Basin. The lower right graphic indicates soil moisture conditions. The darker the shade of green, the wetter the soils. As you can see, South Dakota and parts of Montana are as green as it can get, which means that soil conditions continue to be very wet through those areas. While not as dark a green as South Dakota, the other areas of the entire basin indicate that soils continue to be very saturated. And what that means is with highly saturated soils, there is less infiltration and more runoff for any rainfall event. This concludes video three. Please proceed to video four to hear about the expected results for authorized purposes in 2020. Thank you.